The following is a conversation with Zev Weinstein, a young man with a brilliant, bold, and hopeful mind that I had the great fortune of talking to on a recent afternoon. He happens to be Eric Weinstein's son, but I invited Zev not because of that, but because I got a chance to listen to him speak on a few occasions and was captivated by how deeply he thought about this world at such a young age. And I thought that it might be fun to explore this world of ours together with him for a time through this conversation. Quick mention of our sponsors, ExpressVPN, Grammarly Grammar Assistant, Simply Safe Home Security, and Magic Spoon Low Carb Cereal. So the choice is privacy, grammar, safety, or health. Choose wisely, my friends. And if you wish, click the sponsor links below to get a discount and to support this podcast. As a side note, let me say that Zev acknowledges the fear associated with participating in public discourse and is brave enough to join in at a young age, to push forward, to change his mind publicly, to learn, to articulate difficult, nuanced ideas, and grow from the conversations that follow. In this, I hope he leads the next generation of minds that is joining and steering the collective intelligence of this big ant colony we think of as our human civilization. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter, Lex Friedman. And now, here's my conversation with Zev Weinstein. You've said that philosophy becomes more dangerous in difficult times. What do you mean by that? Interestingly, I think I mean two things by that. And I think firstly, I should clarify, when I say philosophy, I sort of mean in a, a very traditional sense, just thinking, ideation, and that could be reconsidering our notions of self in a very traditional sense, which we consider philosophy, or that could be like technological uh, innovation. I think it's important to recognize all of these as philosophies so that we can not question whether it's important to promote thought. I think the other thing I should clarify is when I say difficult times, I mean times when nothing is growing and so the risk for real conflict is much greater because people are incentivized to fight over the things which already exist. I think when times are not difficult, the people with the greatest power are usually the people who are very creative, generating a lot. And that really requires ideation or philosophy of some sort. I think when times become stagnant, the important successful people become the people who are very good at protecting their own pieces of the pie and taking others. Um, I think that those people have to be very opposed to any sort of thinking that could restructure society or conventions about who should succeed. And so, firstly, I mean by that that it becomes much more dangerous dangerous for a person to think deeply and question during a time when the important people are those concerned with making sure no one rocks the boat. You know, one example of this would be like Socrates and his execution because everyone was happy enough to sit through his questions before uh, there was war and poverty and distress. And afterwards, it just became too dangerous. The other thing I mean by that is that the consequences of thinking deeply carry much greater potential for real catastrophe when everyone is desperate. So like, for example, you know, the Communist Manifesto was probably much more dangerous uh, during early 1900s Russia than it was during the 1848 revolutions because I think people were in much worse shape. Uh, and desperate people are very willing to dive into anything new that might bring the future without fully calculating whatever the consequences or risks might be. So it is both more dangerous for a person to have creative ideas, and those ideas are more dangerous when t when times are tough. And by dangerous, you mean it challenges the people with power who don't, who want to maintain that power 
in times of uh, stagnation, when there's not much growth, innovation, creativity, all that kind of stuff. Right. And we know that if nothing new is created, people uh, have promises that they've made about what will be paid to whom, what debt structure is. The only possibility if stagnation lasts for long enough is really some kind of great conflict, great war, because people have to take from others to make good on their own promises. So we know that by denying any sort of grand ideation, we are accepting that there will be some kind of great catastrophe. And so we have to understand that philosophy is the most important uh, when we've seen too much stagnation for too long. It is also very dangerous, and it's dangerous for the people who are doing it, and it's dangerous for the people who believe it, but it's kind of our only way out ever. And and again, by philosophy, you mean the bigger, so it's not academic philosophy or this kind of uh, games played in the in the space of just like moral philosophy and all those uh, metaphysics, all that kind of stuff. You mean just thinking deeply about this world, thinking from first principles. I think your like Twitter line involves something about like- uh, Trying to piece everything together from it, first principles. So that's, that's fundamentally what uh, being philosophical about this world is. And that's where the people who are thinking deeply about this world are the ones who are feeding, who are the catalyst of this growth in society and so on. Yeah, I, I mean, I also think that the real implication of moral philosophy uh, can be something that most would consider like a, a real political uh, implication. So I think all philosophy really ties together uh, because there has to be some sort of grand structure to all thought and how it relates. Do you think this growth and innovation and improvement can last forever. We've seen some incredible, you know, the thing that humans have been able to accomplish over the past several hundred years is just, I mean, awe-inspiring. And every moment in that in that history, it almost seemed like no more could be done. Like we've, we've solved all the problems that are to be solved. I mean, there's just, historically, there's all these kind of ridiculous, like Bill Gates style quotes, or like, it's obvious that we've uh, this new cool thing is not going to take off, and yet it does. And, and so there's there is a feeling of the same kind of pattern that we see in Moore's law. There's constant growth in different technologies in the modern day era, in any kind of automation over the past hundred years. Do you think it's possible that we'll keep growing this way if we give power to the philosophers of our society? I think the only way that we can keep growing this way is if we give power to real thinkers. Uh, and there's no guarantee that that will work, but we sort of don't have any other choice. And I think you're entirely right that this period of both understanding the universe uh, at a rate which has, has never been seen before and in invention and creativity, that these past hundred years have been sort of uncharacteristic uh, for the level of growth that we've seen in all of history, we've never seen anything like this. And I think a lot of our, uh, a lot of our promises rest on this sort of thing continuing. I think that's very, that's very dangerous. But the one thing that can get us out of this is philosophy and being ready to radically restructure all of our notions about what should be, what is, I think that's very important. So you think deeply about this world. You are clearly this embodiment of a thinker, of a philosopher. Your dad is also one such guy, Eric Weinstein. Do you dis do you have big disagreements with him on this topic in particular? I think now people should know he also happens to be in the room, but uh, the mics can't pick him up so he can uh, heckle. It doesn't even matter. Uh, <laughs> but do you have disagreements with him on this point? Let me... Um, try to summarize his argument that we were actually based a lot of our um, American society on the belief that things will keep growing. And yet it seems that however you break it apart, maybe from an economics perspective, that they're not growing currently. 
And so that's where a lot of our troubles are at. Do you have the same sense that things there's a stagnation period that we're living through over the past couple of decades? I think stagnation, modern stagnation is completely undeniable, particularly scientifically. And I think there have been a, a few fields where tremendous progress has been made very recently. I think my dad might feel that uh, there is sort of an, an inevitability to the ending of this period. And I'm not so certain, so certain that uh, the fall of this great time is completely inevitable because I don't know what thoughts we're capable of producing, what we're able to reconsider. I think we really have to be open to the possibility that uh, all of our standard frameworks where you know, like he will talk about embedded growth obligations. If we continue within the same framework, then we're very susceptible to the dangers of whatever these embedded growth obligations are. I think if we break the frameworks, we have no reason to believe that the problems we're experiencing with our current frameworks will, will follow us. And I think that's the importance of radical thought is we don't know what the solution is, but if there is a solution, it will be born from some very fundamental thinking. And so I have I have great hope. So you have uh, optimism about sort of the power of a single radical idea or mm -hmm. single radical thinker to break our frameworks and uh, break us out of this like uh, spiral down due to whatever the the economic forces that are creating uh, this current stagnation. Yeah, I'm very very hopeful. The optimism of youth. Well, I, sh I share uh, <laughs> I share your optimism. So. Let me let me come back to something you've also talked about. You have very little stuff out there currently, mm -hmm. but the things you have out there, your thoughts, you could just tell how deeply you think about this world. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you mentioned is as you learn about this world, is that you as you read, as you sort of uh, go through different experiences, that you um, that you're open to changing your mind. Um, how often do you find yourself changing your mind? Do you think Zev from 10 years into the future will look back at like at this conversation we're having now and uh, disagree completely with everything you just said? It's entirely possible. And that's one of the things that scares me so much about appearing publicly. I think that the internet can be very intolerant of inconsistency. And I am entirely prepared to be very inconsistent because I know that whatever beliefs I have when subjected to scrutiny may change because that's that's really the only way to to form your truest, uh, most fundamental conceptions about the world around you. And it would take an infinite amount of time to subject every single one of your beliefs to scrutiny. And so that's a, a process that must follow me throughout my entire life. And I know that means that my opinions and perspectives are always to be changing. I'm prepared to accept that about myself. Whether other people are prepared to accept that my uh, public opinions may, may change and vary greatly over time is something I, I don't know. I don't know how tolerant the, the world will be, but I'm very prepared to change anything I I believe in if I think deeply enough about it or a good enough argument is made so that I, I might reconsider. Well, that's there certainly is currently an intolerance and that's one of, the, one of the problems of our age. There's an intolerance towards change. And I'll also ask you about labels. You talked about sort of we like to bin each other into different categories, blue or red or whatever the different categorization is. But it seems like the task before you as a young person defining our future is to make a tolerance of change the the norm. Doing this podcast, for example, and then changing your mind one or two years later and doing so publicly without a big dramatic thing or maybe changing it on a daily basis uh, and just being open about it and being transparent about your thought process. Maybe that is the beacon of hope for the philosophical way uh the path of the philosopher so that's your task in in, in a sense 
is to change your mind openly and bravely. You know, you're right. And maybe I will just have to endure some sort of criticism for doing that. But I think that's very important. I think this ties back to this previous facet of our conversation where we were discussing if uh, you know thinkers would win over systems that are devoted to preventing radical thought or if uh, you know who will win the, the systems or the or the thinkers. I think it's crucial that my generation uh, take up a hand in this fight and I think it's important that I'm a part of that because I know that I have some opportunity to um, there is, I think it is my obligation as a member of a, a generation whose only real hope is to think outside of a system because whatever systems exist are collapsing. I think it is really my my obligation to try to play some role, whatever role I can in being an instrument uh, in, in that change. Are you, uh, as a young mind, do you have a sense of fear about just like how afraid were you to do this podcast conversation? Do you have a sense of fear of thinking publicly? Yeah, I, I don't even think that that fear is irrational. It's very difficult to exist publicly in any form uh, now because it's very easy for anyone to take cheap shots at uh, something which is difficult. And as I said, the people who are trying to have the difficult ideas and conversations are perhaps putting others in, in actual danger because everyone is so desperate that they're, they're, they, might be, they might be willing to, to try anything. So um, there's a certain amount of responsibility which one has to take uh, going before the public. And there is a certain amount of uh, ridicule, which will be completely unwarranted that anyone must endure for it. Um, and I think that that means that, that one has to be afraid because they could both ruin the world and be ruined by the world in, a, in, a, in an unwarranted and undeserved fashion. Um, I would like to believe in myself enough to try to accept this as a task because I think it, people need to try or there's no getting out of this and <laughs> we will end in some kind of crazy, brilliant war. Powerfully put. You've said also that uh, in these times we can't have labels because it hold us, holds us back. Maybe we've already talked about it a little bit, but this idea of labels is really interesting. Uh, why do you think labels hold us back? Well, I think many underestimate the extent to which language and communication really impacts and shapes the ideas and thoughts which are being communicated. And I think if we're willing to accept uh, imperfect labels uh, to categorize particular people or thoughts, in some sense, we are corrupting an abstraction in order to represent it and communicate about it. And I think as we've discussed, those abstractions are particularly important when everything is on fire. Um, we should not be sacrificing uh, grand thought for the ability to express it. I think everyone should work much harder, including myself, to really be thinking abstractly in, ab in abstract terms instead of using concrete terms to discuss abstraction while ruining it slightly. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a skill, actually. Uh, so one one really difficult example of in this uh in the recent time that maybe you can comment on uh if you have been thinking about it, is just politics and there's a lot of labels in politics that it takes a lot of skill to be able to communicate difficult ideas without labels being attached to you that's something that i've been sort of thinking about a lot in uh trying to express, for example, how much I love various aspects of the foundational ideas of this country, like freedom, and just saying, I love America, a, a simple statement. I love the ideas that we're finding to America. Well, often in the current time, 
Well, people will try, they'll desperately try to attach a label to me, for example, for saying I love America, that I'm uh, a Republican, a Donald Trump supporter. And it takes elegance and grace and skill to like, to like avoid those labels so that people can actually listen to the contents of your words versus uh, the summarization that results from just the, the, the labels that they can pin on you. Are you cognizant of the skill required there of being able to communicate without being branded a Republican or a Democrat in this particular set of conversations? I'm sure there's other dangerous labels that could be attached. I don't think there's any way of avoiding that right now. Uh, it might not be anyone's best effort to really try. I think the thing I can say which will most speak to that, which I truly believe, is that participating in modern conventional politics is not being inherently political in a generative sense. It's it's this... It's this repeated trope where politics now is not about creating new political ideologies. It's about defending ideologies which already exist so that everyone can keep what they have. Uh, and that's where all of the, the name calling and the labeling really comes in. It's an attempt to constrict whatever may be generated to standard uh, conversations and discussions so that uh, arguments can be strawmanned and defeated and people can keep what they have because everyone's very, very scared. Um, I want to be very political, but not in a standard political sense where I'm defending a particular party or place on a, on a spectrum. Uh, I would like to play some role in inventing new spectrums. And I think that's most important politically, because uh, above most else, politics is about real power and conventional politicians have real power. Uh, and that power will find terrible outlets if new spectrums for that power to live are not invented. So, so you're not afraid of politics, political discourse at the deepest, richest, uh, level of what political discourse is supposed to mean. Actually, I'm, I'm very afraid of it, but once again, we, <laughs> we have no- That's not paralyzing for you. That you feel like it's a responsibility, you're ready to take it on. Yeah. This, <laughs> this is a good sign. This is, uh, you're a special human. Okay, let's talk uh, maybe fun, maybe profound. Uh, we talked about philosophers, philosophy. Uh, who's your favorite philosopher? Who Like somebody in your current time, but neither influential, or you just enjoy uh, uh, his, her ideas or writing or anything like that? Weirdly, uh, I'll, I'll give an answer which sort of doesn't have much to do with whom I might uh, imagine myself to be. I like Thomas Aquinas at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think he's very inspirational to me given what we're going through. And that's not because his particular uh, ideas of, religion or God or uh, unmoved movers are particularly uh, inspirational to me. And they, I don't even think they were necessarily right. Um, but he was introducing aspects of the scientific method during one of the darkest periods in human <laughs> history when we had lost all hope and reason and ability to think logically. So I think he was really something of a light in the dark. And I think we need to look to people like that at the, uh, at the moment. The other reason why I think I need to, uh, need to learn from him is that even though he was doing something which really need to, needed to be done and uh, introducing scientific thought and reason to a time that, that lacked it, um, he was not saying anything that would have been offensive to whatever powers were in play during his time. He was writing about, you know, the importance of, of faith in God and how we could prove it. And so it's important to remember, I suppose, that having 
ideas that shape the world and which bring the world closer to what we can prove it's supposed to be and how it's supposed to work does not always take some sort of grand contradiction of whatever is in play. Um, and the most courageous thing to do may not always be the most helpful thing to do. And I think mm. it's, it's very easy for anyone with uh, ideas about how everything is, is broken to become very cynical and say, oh, the system, man, they're, they're all wrong. Yeah. Um, I think it takes another kind of discipline to be a person with real ideas and to make the world better without stepping on anyone's toes or contradicting anyone. I have real respect for that. So being able to be, when it's within your principles to operate within the current system of thought. Yeah, and not not offend anyone, not say anything outlandish, but introduce the method by which progress must be achieved. I think that takes a kind of maturity, which is found very rarely uh, now. And I really look to him for inspiration, despite whatever uh, disagreements I may have with the minute details of his philosophy. Yeah, it takes a lot of skill, a lot of character, and yeah, deep thinking to be able to operate within the system when needed and having the fortitude and just the boldness to step outside and to burn the system down when needed, but rarely in opportune moments that would actually have impact. I mean, it's ultimately about impact within the society that you live in, not just making a statement that has no impact. Yeah, and we were talking about how dangerous it is to do real philosophy at, at dangerous, uh, broken times. He was going through the most broken time in history, and he questioned the uh, the methods which made a broken system uh, able to survive. And he was so skilled and so graceful that he w he became a saint in that tradition. And there's something for me to really learn from there. Do you draw any inspiration? Have any interest in the sort of more modern philosophers? Maybe the existentialists. I mean, Nietzsche is one of the uh, the early ones. Do you have thoughts on the guy in general or any of the other existentialists? Well, with regard to Nietzsche, I think I think Yeats might have said that he, he's the worst. You know, he was he was certainly filled with with passionate intensity. Um, I was that think, a compliment? He was the worst, uh, or, uh, <laughs> or well, her criticism. Or Yates both. had this had this big line: "the the best lack all conviction; the worst are filled with passionate passionate intensity." Um, wow. So, um, I think Nietzsche was was destroyed by the the horrors of everything that uh, that went on around him, and I think he, he never really recovered from it. I think that's because um, if, if you think about Nietzsche's philosophy, he was very opposed to any sort of acceptance of what one had. One should always envy those who have more and use that envy to, uh, to fuel their, their growth and become, you know, accept whatever the, the human condition and desires are and Use use those desires to want more and more, and, and and make use of your greed. I think it's very difficult to be truly happy if the thing which you uh, the thing which you pride yourself most on is uh, never being satisfied. And I think Nietzsche was never satisfied, and that was the the danger of his. Philosophy. I think also with his amoralism, you know, there is no good or evil. I sort of disagree with that on a on a pretty fundamental basis. I think that um, our notion of morality is by no means subjective. It's really the proxy for the fitness of a society. I think whatever we consider ethical like don't steal, don't murder, don't do this. Uh, societies have a very difficult time running. It's very hard to run a civilization when everyone is stealing from everyone else and people are 
murdering each other and uh, committing these things which we would consider uh, atrocities. So I think uh, we also, we know this because I think very similar notions of morality have uh, evolved convergently from different traditions. I think um, good is a proxy for a civilization's fitness. And the good news is that that means that evil uh, in being anathema to that good uh, must therefore be uh, the opposite of stable in whatever way that it's evil. And that means that good will always be more stable than evil. And the only way evil can really win is like if everyone dies. So, um, so wait, uh, can you say, can you say that again? Good is a proxy for society's, uh, what? Good is a proxy for the stability and fitness of a civilization. I believe and Damn, evil. that's a good definition. Thank you. So you're throwing some bombs today. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Um, this is exciting. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt your uh, flow there, but it's just a good, damn good line. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so in that sense, that's a kind of optimistic view that if by definition, good is a proxy for stability, then it's going to be stable unless the entire world just blows itself up. So good wins in the end by definition. Yeah. Or uh, no, actually, well, good wins unless it all goes to uh, complete destruction. Beautiful. That's like beautifully put. Thank you. On the topic of um, sort of you know good and evil being human illusions, you've said that uh, more broadly than that about truth that it is easier in some ways to be unified under truth because it is universal than it is to be unified under belief, which at times can be completely subjective. So what is the nature of truth to you? Can, can we understand the world objectively or is most of what we can understand about the world is just uh, subjective opinions that we kind of all agree on in these little collectives and over time it kind of evolves completely detached from objective reality. I think this is the greatest argument for objectivity uh, is that something that is objectively true cannot be true to me and untrue to to you. You can feel that it's that it's untrue, but that would be uh, unproductive and create unnecessary tension and conflict. I think, this is one reason for the importance of science as a tool for stability. Uh, if science is the search for truth, um, and truth can never really be, I shouldn't say that, truth should never be an engine uh, of conflict because no two people should disagree on something which is objectively true, then in some sense, search for truth is searching for a common ground where we can all exist and live without uh, contradicting or attacking each other. Do you have a hope that there is a lot of common ground to be discovered? Sure. I mean, if we continue scientifically, uh, we are discovering truth and in that discovering common ground on which we can all agree. That's, that's one reason why I think uh, caring about science. If you have a culture which cares very deeply about science, uh, that's a culture which is not necessarily bound to endure uh, unwarranted internal conflict. I think that's one reason that I'm so passionate about science is its search for universal ground. Let me just throw out an example of a modern day philosophical thinker. We'll keep your uh, dad, Eric Weinstein, out of the picture for a sec. <laughs> but he, he does happen to be an example of one. But Jordan Peterson is an example of another, somebody who thinks deeply about this world. Um, his ideas are, by a certain percent of the population, sort of speaking of truth, are labeled as dangerous. Uh, why do you think his ideas or just ideas of these kinds of deep thinkers in general are labeled as dangerous in our modern world? Is it similar to what you've been discussing that, uh, 
in difficult times, philosophers become dangerous? Or is there something specific about these particular thinkers in our time? Well, I think Jordan Peterson is very anti-establishment in a lot of his uh, beliefs. He's an unconventional thinker. And I think we need, regardless of whatever uh, Jordan's particular views and beliefs are, and if they uh, bring about more danger than uh, truth, or if, if they don't, it's very important to have fundamental thinkers who exist outside of a conventional framework. So do I think that he's dangerous? I think by existing outside of uh, a, a system which is known, he is dangerous. And I think we have to, in some sense, we have to welcome danger in that capacity because it will be our only way out of this. So I'm, regardless of whether his beliefs are right or, or wrong, I'm pretty adamant about the fact that we need to support um, thought which may rescue us. And that thought can appear radical or dangerous at times, but ultimately, if you allow for it, this is kind of the difficult discussion of free speech and so on, is ultimately difficult ideas will pave the way for progress. Yeah, and I'd actually, I'd like to to slow you down there because I think um, like one of the issues we were discussing previously was the fact that language often uh, destroys our ability to think. Um, when we're talking about whether his ideas are, are radical, I don't know if we if we mean radical in the traditional sense of having to to do with the root of a problem, or in the more modern sense of being um, very extreme. And I think that's completely by design. I think fundamental thought, which uh, semantically would once be considered radical thought became very dangerous. And now it's become synonymous with extreme or dangerous thought, mm -hmm. which means that anyone who considers themselves a radical thinker is ling semantically also a, a dangerous or extreme thinker. These are not helpful labels in a sense that the moment you say radical or extremist thinker, then you're just, uh, well, how do I put it? You're not being, you're not helping the public discourse, the yeah, exchange but, of ideas. But through no fault of our own, the concept of radical as having to do with a root is, uh, it's, a, it's an obvious concept for which there must be language. And a lot of the attack on thought has to do with attacking language, which communicates uh, conceptually. So uh, like this is an example of how our world is becoming increasingly Orwellian. It's just language is being used to destroy our ability to, uh, to think. I think, I can't remember exactly what the numbers are, but I read some statistic about how greatly the average English vocabulary has decreased since 1960. It was like some incredible number. It really baffled me. It's like, how are, how are people less able to, to think in a time when the world is supposed to be growing at a never before seen rate? It's like, we can't keep on, we can't sustain this growth if uh, we destroy everyone's ability to think because the growth requires thinking and we're, we're ruining the, the tools for it. I, I watched your, uh, your podcast with Noam Chomsky and I, I think one interesting thing which he discussed was how language is more used to develop thoughts within our own head than it, it is used to communicate those thoughts with others. Uh, if the language doesn't change, even if its usage changes, then uh, when language is destroyed in communication, it also uh, stymies our ability to, to think reasonably. And I'm very, very worried. So, but the language in communication uh, 
requires a medium and there's a lot of different mediums. So there's uh, social media, there's Twitter, mm -hmm. there's uh, writing books, there's blog posts, there's um, podcasts, there's uh, YouTube videos, all of things you have uh, dipped a toe in. Uh -huh. in your exploration of different mediums of communication. Yeah. Which do you see yourself? This might be just a poetic way of asking, are you going to do a podcast? But a broad, <laughs> broader picture, what do you think as an intellectual in this world for you personally would be the path for communicating your ideas to the world? What are the mediums you, you are currently drawn to out of, out of the ones I mentioned, maybe something I didn't? To answer your, your question concretely before, uh, abstractly, uh, I'm scared, but I need, I need to do a podcast. You know, it's, it's important. It is my obligation as a member of my generation. I, I really hope that more people my age start to do this because uh, we, we will be the people in charge of, of new ideas, which either sink or, uh, or swim. How upset would your dad be when your podcast quickly becomes more popular than his. I think he would be negatively upset. Oh, so you'd be proud. I, He's a good dad. I, I really think so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, but then zooming out, do you think podcasts, are you excited by the possibility of other mediums outside of podcasting to communicate ideas? I would be if people still read books or, or did things <laughs> like that. Uh, I'm somewhat guilty of this. A lot of the books I, I read are um, very technical, and then my to absorb like really deep modern conversations, I listen to uh, I listen to podcasts, and I don't really read many uh, books on like the matters that we're discussing. For example, it's fascinating because you're making me think of something. Um that I align with you very much of how I consume deep thinkers currently. So what happens is somebody who thinks deeply about the world will write a book, mm -hmm. uh, Jordan Peterson example. And instead of reading their book, I'll just listen to podcast conversations of them talking about the book, yeah. which I find to, this is really sad, but I find that to be a more compelling way to think about their ideas because they're often challenged in certain ways in those conversations. And they're forced to, after having boiled them down and really thought through them enough to write a book. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like they needed to go through the process of writing a book just so they could think through, convert the language in their minds into something more concrete. And then the actual exchange of ideas, the actual communication of ideas with the public happens not with the book, but after the book with that person going on a book tour <laughs> and yeah. communicating the ideas. Well, there are two meanings I, I make of why not too many people spend much of their time reading anymore. One, one interpretation is that we've lost our attention spans to our phones. People can't concentrate on a page if it takes them a minute to read. We're too busy you know, watching TikToks or whatever people do. Um, the other interpretation would be that language and verbal communication has as well as you know some amount of communication which is done through you know facial expression uh, tone of voice etc these are means of communication that have evolved along with humanity over thousands and thousands of years so um, we know that we are built to communicate in this way uh, we have had writing for much less time. It is a system that we invented, not a system which evolved and is innately part of uh, you know, humanity or the, the human mind. Um, and so we are designed to consume conversation by our own evolution. We are designed to consume writing uh, by some process of symbols that's evolved over a couple thousand years. Um, it makes sense to me why many are, are much more compelled to listen to podcasts, for example, than they are to read books. It could be that this is simply a technological 
uh, progression, which has displaced uh, reading conventionally instead of some sort of maladaptation of our minds, which has uh, corrupted our attention spans. Uh, you know, likely there's some combination which uh, determines why people spend much less time reading. But I don't think it's necessarily because we're all broken. It may simply have to do with the fact that we are designed to listen and through our ears and speak through our mouths. And um, we are not innately designed to communicate uh, over a page. So, Yeah, there's an exciting coupling to me between like few second TikTok videos that are fun and addicting, and then the three, four hour podcasts, which are both really popular in our current time. So people are both hungry for the visual stimulation of uh, internet humor uh -huh. and memes, I'm a huge fan of, and also slow moving, deep conversations. And that might, you know, it's, there's a lot of, I mean, it's part of your generation to define what that looks like moving forward. We're a lot of people, like Joe Rogan is one of the people that kind of uh, started, accidentally stumbled into the discovery that this is like a thing. Yeah. And now people are kind of scrambling to figure out why is this a thing? Like, why is there so much hunger for long form conversations? And how do we optimize that medium for further, further expression of deep ideas and all that kind of stuff? And YouTube is a really interesting medium for that as well. Mm -hmm. Like video, sharing of videos, most of YouTube is used with a spirit of like the TikTok spirit, if I can put it in that way, which is like, how do I have quick moving things that even if you're expressing difficult ideas, they should be quick and exciting and mm -hmm. visual and switching but there's a lot of exploration there to see what can we do something deeper and nobody knows. And you're part of the, you have a YouTube channel uh, releasing one video every few years. Um, so <laughs> so your momentum is currently quite slow, but uh, perhaps it'll accelerate. But you're, you're, uh, you're one of the people that gets to define that medium. Is that, do you enjoy that, the visual, the YouTube medium of communication as well? I know that, when the the topic of conversation uh, or the the means uh, by which a conversation is is communicated or an idea is communicated, if that is sufficiently interesting to me, um, I will read a book on it. I would listen to a podcast on it. I would watch a a video uh, on it. I think if I'm very curious about something. Uh, I will consume it however possible. I think when I have to consume things which really don't interest me very much, uh, I'm indeed much more ready to consume them through some sort of video or discussion than I am through like a long, tedious book. So for the, the, for the breadth of uh, acquiring knowledge, video is good. For the depth, the medium doesn't matter. I think it'd be fun to ask you about some big philosophical questions to see if you have an opinion on okay. them. <laughs> uh, do you think there's a free will or is free will uh, just an illusion? Well, I think classical mechanics would tell us that if we are, if we were to know every piece of information about a system and understand the rules which govern that system, we would be completely able to predict the future with complete accuracy. So if something could know everything about our lives, it could freeze time and, and understand the position of every neuron in my mind about, about to fire, um, no decision could be uh, unpredictable. It, it, there, in some sense, there is that sort, of, uh, that sort of fate. I think that doesn't make the decisions we make illegitimate, even if some grand supercomputer could uh, understand what decisions we would make beforehand with complete certainty. I think we're making legitimate systems uh, within a system that has no freedom. We're making legitimate systems within a system that has no freedom. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. So if we were to have uh, just a simple pendulum, and I told you how long the the rope was, 
I, I, we froze it at a particular um, point, and I told you how high, ob- high above the ground the, the weight was, and uh, you know the motion of a of a pendulum is something which is it's easy for everyone to imagine. Um, I could, if we had all of that information, you could ask me where will the what will the pendulum do six and a half minutes from now, and we would have a, a precise answer. That's like a that's an example of a very simple system with a very simple Lagrangian, um, and we could completely predict the the future. The the pendulum has no ability to do anything uh, that would surprise us. Weirdly, that's true of whatever this four dimensional crazy world we live in uh, looks like. If we were to if we were to understand where every piece of this system was at any given time, and we we understand the the laws of motion, how everything worked, if we could compute all of that information somehow, which we will never be able to do, uh, we would. Uh, <laughs> Every decision you you will ever make could be predicted by that computer. That doesn't mean that your decisions are illegitimate. You are really making those decisions, but with a completely predictable outcome. So I'm just uh, sort of a little bit high at the moment on the uh, on this on the poetry of a system within a system that has no freedom. So the human experience is the system we've created within the system that has no freedom, but that system that we've created has a feeling of freedom that to us ants feels as uh, much more real than the the physics as we understand it of the underlying the, like base system. So it's almost like not important what the physics of the base system is that for the what we've created, the nature of the human experience is uh, there is a free will. <laughs> or there is something that feels uh, close enough to a free will that it may not be uh, worth uh, spending too much time on the fact that it's, it's something of an illusion. We will never build a computer that knows everything about every piece of the universe at a given time. Uh, and so, for all intensive purposes, uh, our decisions are up to us. We just happen to know that their outcomes could be predicted with enough information. So, um, speaking of supercomputers, they can predict every single uh-huh. thing about the uh, what's going to ever happen. Uh, what do you think about the philosophical thought experiment of us living in a simulation? Do you? often find yourself pondering of us living in a simulation of this question? Do you think it is at all a useful thought experiment? I think it's very easy to become fascinated with all of these possibilities, and they're completely legitimate uh, possibilities. You know, like, do I, is there some validity to, like, solipsism? Uh, Well, it can never be falsified or, or disproven, so, I mean, sure, you could be a, a figment of my uh, imagination. Uh, it doesn't mean that I will act according to this possibility. I'm not going to call you mean names and <laughs> <laughs> just to test the system uh, to see how robust it is to distortions. Yeah. So, I mean, all of these existential thought experiments are completely possible. We could be brains in jars. It doesn't mean that our experience will feel any less valid. And so it doesn't make a difference to me if uh, you are some number of of ones and zeros or you are a figment of my imagination, which lives in a in a stored stored away brain. Uh, it will never really change my experience uh, knowing that that's a possibility. And so I try to, I try to avoid making decisions based on such contemplations. You know, if we take this this previous issue of of free will, um, I could I could decide that um, because I have no choice in my life, if I uh, lie around in bed all day and eat chips, 
I was destined to do that thing. And if I make that decision, then I was destined to do that thing. It would be a really poor decision uh, for me to make. I have school and a, a dozen commitments. Uh, There's somebody listening to this right now, probably hundreds of people sitting down, eating chips and feeling terrible about themselves. Those are, so how if, dare if, you, sir? If they're listening to this, they're clearly, they're clearly curious about um, possibilities of, of thought. It's not the, it's not the bed and the chips that, <laughs> okay. that makes the man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the bed or the chips that makes the man. Yet another quotable from Zev Weinstein. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but you don't think of it as a useful thought experiment from an engineering perspective of, you know, virtual reality of thinking how we can create further and further immersive worlds. Like, would it be possible to create worlds that are so immersive that we would rather live in that world versus the real world? I mean, that's another possible trajectory of the world that you're growing up in, is we're more and more Im immersing ourselves into the digital world. For now, it's screens and looking at the screens and socializing the screens, but it's possible to potentially create a world that's also visually for all of our human senses as immersive as the physical world. And then, you know, it's a, to me, it's an engineering question of how yeah. difficult is it to create a world that's as immersive and more fun than uh, the, the world we currently live yeah, it's in. It's a terrifying concept and I hate to say it, we might live happier lives in a virtual reality headset 30 years from now than we are currently living. This future, the digital future worries you. It worries me. On the other hand, it may be, it may be a, a better al alternative to um, fighting for whatever people are clinging onto in our uh, non-virtual world, or at least the world that we don't yet know is virtual. So, so. embrace the future. We've been talking a lot about thinkers. Mm -hmm. Now, in the broad definition of philosophy, you kind of included innovators of all form. Mm -hmm. Do you find it useful to draw a distinction between thinkers and doers? I think that the most important gift we've ever been given is our ability to observe the universe and think deductively about whatever principles transcend humanity. Because, uh, you know, as we discussed, that's that's the closest thing we will ever have to um, a universal experience is understanding things, which must be true um, everywhere. In order for that, so I think if if we're if we're deciding that that life is is meaningful uh, and the human experience is meaningful, uh, you could make a, a very convincing argument that. Uh, its greatest meaning will be understanding whatever transcends it. Um, I think that's only sustainable if people are happy and well-fed and uh, things of, of market value are uh, invented. And so I think we really need both to live meaningful and successful and possible lives. In terms of like who who my greatest heroes are, I can't decide between figures like uh, Einstein and Newton and Feynman and on the other hand figures like um, like Carrie Mullis, for example. Uh, I think people like Einstein make our lives meaningful and People like Carrie Mullis, uh, who's probably responsible for saving hundreds of millions of, of lives, make our make our lives possible and uh, good. So, in terms of where I would like to find myself uh, with these two different uh, notions of achievement, I don't know what I would more like to achieve. I have an inclination that it will be something scientific because I would like to bring meaning to humanity instead of uh, sustenance. But I think both are, are very important. We can't, we can't sustain our lives if we don't keep growing technologically. I think people like you are making that possible with 
uh, like computing because that's one of the few things that's really moving forward in a in a clear sense. Um, I think of, I think about this a great deal. So I think both are are very important. So one example that's modern day uh, inspiring figure on the on the latter part and the engineering part mm-hmm. on the sustenance is uh, Elon Musk. Does that somebody you draw inspiration from? Uh, what are your thoughts in general about the kind of unique spec of human that's creating so much? Uh, inspiring innovation in this world so boldly. I know that we will not survive without people like that. Um, Elon is a ridiculous and sensational example of one of these figures. Um, I don't know if he's the best example or the worst example, but he is he is of his own kind. He is radically individualistic. And those are the people who will allow us to continue uh, as as humans. I'm I'm very happy that that we have people like that in this world. You, you said this thing about if we are to say that life has meaning, mm-hmm. or life is meaningful, then you could argue that it is a worthy pursuit to transcend life. Do you see that another just I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to go back uh, and sleep on that one. <laughs> uh, do you do you draw some speaking of Elon some inspiration of us uh, transcending Earth of us moving outside of. Uh, this particular planet that we've called home for a long time and colonizing other planets and perhaps one day expanding outside the solar system and uh, expanding, colonizing our galaxy and beyond. Honestly, I know very little about space exploration. I think it makes complete sense to me why we are starting to think very seriously about it. It's an amazing and baffling and innovative solution to a lot of problems we see as a world population. I can't really offer very much uh, of interest on the topic. I think when I'm talking about like transcending humanity and transcending Earth, um, I'm talking usually about deriving truth and that's one of the things that makes like theoretical math and physics um, so interesting. It's like I, I really, really love biology, for example, but uh, biology is a combination of whatever principles ensure evolution and whatever weird coincidences happened billions of years ago. Um, so to you, it's more interesting to understand the fundamental mechanisms of evolution, for example, than it is the results, the messy results of its processes. I can't say which is more interesting. I can say which I think is more is more deep. I think theory and abstraction, which can be achieved completely deductively, uh, is deeper because it has nothing to do with circumstance and everything to do with uh, logic and thought. Uh, so, like, if we were ever to to interact with aliens, for example, uh, we would not have our biology in common if if these were were some sort of really intelligent life form. uh, We would have math and physics in common because uh, the laws of physics will be the same every everywhere in the universe. They our particular anatomy and biology pertains uh, only to life on this on this planet and the principles may apply more ubiquitously do you, do you ever think about aliens like what they might look like I try to when I, I deal with thought experiments like these I try to keep a very abstract uh, mindset and I notice that whenever uh, I try to instantiate these abstractions I 
I corrupt whatever thoughts uh, there are for which they're useful. So it's kind of like the labels discussion. So like the moment exactly. you try to make it concrete, it's probably going to look like some cute version of a human, a big like it's the little green fellas with the with the eyes and so on, or whatever. Whatever the movies uh, have instilled, like your cultural upbringing, you're going to project onto that and the assumptions you have. Exactly. That's interesting. So you prefer to sort of step away and think and abstract notions of what it means to be intelligent, what it means to be a living life form, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I try to. I almost try to pretend I'm I'm blind and I'm deaf and I'm only. Um, a mind with no inductive reasoning capacity when I'm trying to think about uh, thought experiments like these, because I know that uh, if I incorporate whatever my eyes uh, instruct my brain, I will uh, I will impede my ability to think as deeply as possible. Because once again, it's the, the thing which shallows our thought can be the incorporation of circumstance and coincidence. And for particular kinds of thought, that's very important. I'm not discounting the use of inductive reasoning um, in many humanities and in many sciences, but for the deepest of thoughts, once again, I, I, I feel it's important to try to transcend whatever uh, methods of observation characterize human experience. See, but within that, that's all really beautifully put. I, I wonder if there is a common mathematics and a common physics between us and alien beings, we still have to make concrete the methods of communication. Yeah. Uh, and that's a fascinating question of like, while remaining in these abstract fundamental ideas, how do we communicate with uh, them? I mean, that, I suppose that question could be applied to different cultures on earth. <laughs> but it's f finding a common language. Uh, do you think about that kind of problem of basically communicating abstract fundamental ideas? My least favorite aspect of math or physics or any of these really deep sciences is the symbolic component. You know, I'm, I'm dyslexic. I don't like looking at, at symbols. They're too often a source of, of ambiguity. And I think you're entirely right that if one thing holds us back with um, communication with something that, that, that behaves or, or looks nothing like us, I think if one thing holds us back, uh, it will be symbols and the communication of deep thought. Because as I said, I think communication frequently compromises thought uh, by intention or by just uh, theoretical inadequacy. So on, on this topic, actually, it'd be fun to see what your thoughts are. Uh, do you think math is uh, invented or discovered? So you said that math, we might share ideas of mathematics and physics with alien life forms. So it's uniform in some sense of uniform throughout the universe. What, uh, do you think this thing that we call mathematics is uh, something that's kind of fundamental to the world we live in, or is it just some kind of uh, pretty uh, axioms and theorems we've come up with to try to describe the uh, the patterns we see in the world? Uh, I think it's completely discovered and completely fundamental to all experience. I think the only component of mathematics that has been invented is the expression of it. And I think in some sense, there's almost uh, an arrogance required to believe that whatever aspect uh, we invent uh, having to do with uh, math and physics and theory, there is an arrogance required to truly believe that that belongs on any sort of stage with the actual beauty of the matters being discovered. So um, we need our minds and in some sense our, our pens to be able to play with these things at, uh, and communicate about them. And those hands and those are and those pens are the things which, smudge the most beautiful thing that humanity can ever 
um, experience. And maybe if we interact with some intelligent life form, uh, they will have their own unique smudges, but the canvas, uh, which is beautiful, must be identical because that is universal and ubiquitous truth. And that's what makes it deep and, and meaningful is that it's so much more important than uh, whatever we're programmed to enjoy as an aspect of human experience. Yeah, that um, that's really beautifully put. Thank that you. the human language is these messy smudges of trying to express something underlying that is beautiful. Speaking of that, uh, on the physics side, do you think the pursuit of a theory of everything in physics, as we may call it in our current times, of understanding the basic fabric of reality from a physics perspective is an important pursuit? I think it's essential. Uh, as I've said, I think ideation is our only escape from the constraints of human condition. And I think that it's important that all great thoughts and ideas are bound together. And I think the math is beautiful and it ensures that um, the things which bind uh, great ideas, which have already been had and great discoveries together, it, uh, it, it, it ensures that those strings will be beautiful. Uh, I think it's very important to unify all theories that have brought us to, to where we are. Do you think humans can do it? Do you think humans can solve this puzzle? Is it possible that we, with our limited cognitive capacity, will never be able to truly understand this deep, like deeply understand this underlying canvas? I think if not, it will be people like you who invent uh, some sort of, I don't know, we'll, we'll call it computation for now, that will be um, able to not only discover that which transcends humanity, but to transcend human methods of discovering that which is above it. So super intelligent systems, AGI and so on, that, that are better physicists than us. I, I wonder if you might be able to comment. So your dad does happen to be somebody who boldly seeks this kind of um, deep understanding of physics the underlying nature of reality from a physics perspective, from a mathematical physics perspective. Uh, do you have hope your dad figures it out? I have great hope. You know, it's not it's not supposed to be my journey. It's supposed to be his journey. It's supposed to be his to uh, express to the world. Obviously, I'm I'm so proud that I'm connected to someone who is determined to do such a thing. And on the other hand, uh, you know, maybe in some sense, I, I feel bad for him for having to, if he's gonna be the, the thing which, which discovers some sort of grand unified theory and expresses it, I feel sorry that he will have to, to smudge um, whatever <laughs> canvas this thing is because- <laughs> Because he's human. <laughs> really, I think, I know uh, I've seen a little bit of what I think great math and great physics looks like, and it's it's unbelievably beautiful. And then you have to present it to a world with you know like market constraints and all of this like messy sloppiness. I feel bad um, in some sense for my dad uh, because he has to go back and forth between this beautiful world of math and whatever the the messiness is of his, you know, his human life. And then the scientific community broadly with egos and tensions and just exactly. the, the dynamics of our, of what makes us uh, human. He's also very lucky that he gets to play with these sorts of things. It's, it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I both feel a little sorry for him for having to deal with the beauty as well as the, uh, the smudging and the, the sloppiness of, human expression and i think it's difficult not to envy such a um such a beautiful insight or life or or, or vision 
So, well, that's your own path as well as this kind of struggle of, um, as you mentioned, exploring the beauty of different ideas mm -hmm. while having to communicate those ideas w with the best smudges you can uh, in a world that wants to put labels, that wants to misinterpret, that wants to uh, that wants to destroy the beauty of those ideas. And that's, you seem to, at this time, with your youthful enthusiasm, uh, embracing that struggle, uh, despite the fear, in the face of fear. So, and uh, your dad also carries that same youthful enthusiasm as well. But that said, you know, your dad, Eric Weinstein, he's a powerful voice, I would say, a powerful mm -hmm. intellect in public discourse. Is this a burden for you? or an inspiration or both as a young mind yourself? I think, as I said, there's this, this there's this weird contrast of, um, you know, I know that he has ideas, which I think are, are very beautiful. And I know he has to deal with um, the sort of, uh, there's there's something you, you have to sacrifice in beauty, uh, when you bring it to a world which is not always um, beautiful. Um, and there's there's an aspect of that which sort of scares me about uh, this kind of thing. I also think that, um, especially since I'm trying to think about how I should appear publicly, my dad has been very inspirational in that I think he's he brings a sort of fastidious care to very difficult conversations that- What does fastidious mean? Um, like it's just very careful okay. and um, thoughtful. Um, he brings that sort of attitude to, um, I think really difficult conversations. And I know that I don't have that skill yet. I don't think I'm terrible, but- so The care, the nuance, and yet not being afraid to push forward. Yeah, I would really like to to learn from my dad there. I think also my dad has been very important uh, to my life just because I've always been a, a sort of very idiosyncratic thinker. Um, and I think I don't always know how to interact with the world for those sorts of reasons. And I think my dad has always been similar. And if not for my dad, I don't know if I would just believe that like I, I was stupid or something. Mm. Um, because I wouldn't know how to, how to, I don't know if I would know how to interpret uh, my differences from convention. So, so he gave you, he gave you the power to be different and use that as a superpower. Yeah, I, I guess you could, you could put it that way. I don't know who I would believe I am if uh, I didn't have my dad telling me that it wasn't my own stupidity which alienated me from certain aspects of uh, standard life. So I'm very, very thankful for that. Is there a fond memory you have about an interaction with your dad, either funny, profound, that kind of sticks with you now? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Part, part of the reason I asked that, of course, it's just fascinating to uh, see somebody as brilliant as you, see how your the people that you interact with, how they form the mind that you have, but also to give an insight of another public uh, figure like your dad to see from your perspective of um, what kind of little magical moments happen in private life. I would say, I remember, I think I just, posted about this on on Instagram or something. I <laughs> Otherwise it didn't happen if, if you didn't post that, yeah. One person who's always sort of mattered to whatever weird life and experience I've had has been this this comedian Tom Lehrer. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you know him? Yes. He's, yeah. uh, I, I love him very much. Likewise. Um anyway, I remember I think I was 5 or something. My dad came home with the with the CD this Tom Lehrer CD and he told me to to listen to it. And it was all of this like bizarre uh, satirical writing about, you know, like prostitution and mm -hmm. you know, cutting up babies and like all kinds of like ridiculously vile um, 
content for a for a five year old. I think beyond just my love of of Tom Lehrer, I think it was a way for my dad to express that from a very young age he was uh, he was really ready to treat me like an adult, and he was ready to to trust me and share um, share his his life and his uh, enjoyments with me um, in a way that was unconventional because he was willing to uh, discard tradition for the chance at a really uh, unique and meaningful uh, parental relationship. So trusting that the, his particular brand of weirdness is something you can understand at a young age and embrace and learn from it. Tom Lair, we should clarify, is not all about, what is it, murder and prostitution. He's one of the wittiest, most brilliant musical right. artists. If, if you haven't listened uh, to his work, you should. He's just uh, a rare intellect who's able to sort of in catchy rhyme express some really difficult ideas and sat through satire, I suppose. Uh, that, I will, that still, even though it's decades ago, still resonates today, some of the ideas that he expressed. I will say also that um, I think I am probably uh, a, a more cultured person having listened to Tom Lehrer than I would have been without. I think a lot of his comedy uh, draws upon a canon that I was really driven to to research by saying, "Oh, well, what does this mean? I don't, I don't understand that reference." There are a lot of references there to um, really, really inspirational things, which he sort of assumes going into a lot of his songs. And for many of us, like like me, you have to piece those things together. You know, looking at, at Wikipedia pages and whatnot. But um, to tie this back to the original question, I think, um, I think there's sort of a a break it, you bought it notion of parenting. I think, uh, really, if you're if you're not going to accept a a standard, um, you have to invent your own. And I think, in some ways, that was my dad's way of telling me that if I was too unstandard as a child, he wouldn't he would invent his own way of parenting me because that was worth it to him. And I think that was very meaningful to me. I know you're young. This is a weird time to ask this question. Uh, are you cognizant on the role of love in your relationship with your dad? Are you at a place uh, mentally as a man yourself uh, to admit that you love the guy? I love my dad like I, uh, with the connection that I think I've had to very few things in the world. I think my dad is one of the people that's allowed me to see myself and I don't know uh, who I would imagine myself to be, if not for my dad. That isn't to say that I agree with him on everything, but I think he's given me courage to accept myself and to believe that I can uh, teach myself where I'm unable to to learn from convention. So I have a very, <laughs> I love my dad very dearly, yes. Is there ways in which you wish you could be a better son? Firstly, I'd like to say I'm sure before I, I figure out exactly what those are. I think if I, I think whenever I come to conclusions on what that means, I'm, I'm eager to uh, to take them. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, what, what, what do you mean by conclusions? If I have an idea for how to be a better son, I think I'm I'm inclined to to try to be that person. I think that's true of almost anything. I think if I have uh, ideas for improvement, it would be wasteful not to not to not to act on them. So, um, I suppose one thing I could say is that um, I think idealism and what could almost be considered naivete is not necessarily a um, a lacking of maturity, but instead an obligation to those older than us who have lived lived and seen too much um, to fully believe uh, in what is 
naive and right without um without the assistance of the young to re-inspire uh traditional idealism and so perhaps instead of trying to be uh more mature uh all the time i should spend some time trying to be uh, an idealistic form of hope in the lives of people who maybe have seen too much to retain all of that original hope so uh, that's something that's that's difficult but you know especially appearing in public as someone as as young as i am uh, i think anything i do which is juvenile by choice will be held against me so but maybe that's a sacrifice that i i have to make i have to retain some sort of youthful hope and optimism yeah i can't i mean uh i'm gonna get teary-eyed no but uh, i have allergies <laughs> but i also this is pretty powerful what you're saying i certainly share your ideas it's something i s struggle with i've just by instinct, you should read The Idiot by Dostoevsky. By instinct, I'm, I love being naive and uh, seeing the world from a hopeful perspective, from an optimistic perspective. And it is, it's sad that that is something you pay a price for in this world. Like in the academic world, especially as you're coming up uh, through, through schooling, but just actually it's a hit on your reputation throughout your life. And it's a sad truth, but you have to like, for many things, if it's a principle you hold, you have to be willing to pay the costs. And ultimately, I believe that in part, a hopeful view will help you realize the best version of yourself because optimism is a kind of, um, optimism is productive. <laughs> like uh, believing that the world is and can be amazing is um allows you to create a more amazing world somehow i mean i'm not sure if uh, i'm not sure if it's a human nature or a fundamental law of physics i don't know but uh, -huh. uh believing the impossible in the sense being optimistic about the thing it's 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 similar like going back to what you've said is like believing that a radical that a powerful single idea that a single individual can uh revolutionize some framework that we're operating in that will change the world for the better. Believing that allows you to have the chance to create that. And so I'm, I'm with you on the optimism, but mm -hmm. it's a, you may have to pay a cost of optimism and uh, naive hopefulness. And I mean, in world. some sense, optimism limits freedom. Uh, I think if we don't really have much choice in choosing what is perfect, if it exists as, as an ideal, um, then there isn't much room for, for creativity. And that's a danger of optimism as someone who uh, would like to be creative. I think, I think it was Warren Zevon said, uh, accepting dreams, you're never really free. And that's something I, I think about a lot. Um, he's an interesting guy also, I really like him. <laughs> On that topic, you do have uh, a bit of an appreciation and connection with music. I saw you play some guitar a few months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, what what uh, can you put in like a philosophical sense, your connection to music, uh, what insights about life, mm -hmm. about just the way you see the world do you get from music? I think the role music has played in my life was originally motivated by sort of wanting to to prove things to myself. I really have no ear for music. I have a terrible <laughs> sense of pitch. And I think a lot of music relies on very standard teaching. If you think about uh, lessons, for example, music lessons, there's, there's sort of a, a routine to them, which is so archaic and traditional that there's no room for, for, de for deviation. I think all of that suggested to me that I would never have a relationship with music. I loved listening to music. It was just, it was difficult to me. It, was, it sort of saddened me. Um, I wanted to know if there was any way I could build a connection to music given who I am, my own idiosyncrasies, um, what challenges I have. I decided to try to learn music theory before I touched an instrument uh, 
I think that gave me a very unique opportunity instead of spending my time fruitlessly at the beginning on the syntax of a particular instrument. This is how you, this is your posture on the piano. This is how you hold your fingers. Uh, I tried instead to learn what made music work. And the, the wonderful thing about that was I'm pretty sure that any instrument with discrete notes is mine for the taking within a day or so of having the ability to to play with it. So I think approaching music abstractly gave me the ability to instantiate it uh, everywhere. And I think it also taught me something about self-teaching. Like recently I've tried getting into, into classical music because uh, at least traditionally this is the thing which is thought to require the most rigor um, and traditional uh, teaching. I think it's essentially taught me, even if I'll never be a great classical performer, that there is nothing one can't really teach themselves in this mm-hmm. in this era. So I've been I've been enjoying uh, whatever connection I have with with music. The other thing I'll I'll, I'll say about it is that it's a it's a very rewarding uh, learning process. We know, for example, that music uh, accesses our neurochemicals very directly. Uh, and if you teach yourself a little bit of theory and are able to instantiate it on an instrument without wasting your, your time or spending your time uh, tediously on learning the particulars of that instrument, you can instantly sit down and access your own dopamine loops. And so you don't really need to motiv- uh, motivate yourself with music because, you know, like you're giving your, your brain drugs, you know, who needs motivation to, to give themselves drugs um, and, and, and learn something. So uh, I think, I think more people should be, should be playing music. I think a lot of people don't realize how, how easy it can be to approach if you take a sort of um, unstandard approach. And the unstandard approach in your sense was uh, understanding the theory first, and then just from the from the foundation of the theory, be able to then just uh, take on any instrument and start creating something that sounds reasonably good. Yeah. Or learning something yeah. that sounds reasonably good, and then <laughs> plugging into the, as you call them, the dopamine loops of your brain allowing yourself to enjoy the process. Yeah. What about the uh, the pain in the ass, rigorous process of practice? So, so there's something about my dopamine loops, for example, that enjoys doing the same thing over and over and over again and watching myself improve. I think that's because um, music is more effective at uh, accessing us when it's played correctly. And I think you play, I'm, I'm positive that you play music much more correctly than I do. So if you are going to sit down and play something that you've learned, that piece will be much more satisfying to your ears and to your brain than if I were to play that piece just sitting down within, with an instrument. Uh, but it's sort of a trade-off with freedom and, and rigor uh, because even if I should be spending more, more of my time practicing rigorously, I know I don't have to, to make me happy, so. Well, Jocko Willink, I think, has this saying uh, that discipline is freedom. Uh-huh. So maybe uh, maybe the repetition of uh, the disciplined repetition is actually one of the mechanisms of achieving freedom. It's another way to get to freedom. That it doesn't have to be a constraint, but in, in, in a sense unlocks greater sets of opportunity that then results in a deeper experience of freedom. Maybe, I mean, particularly if you're thinking about uh, discipline and uh, method for improvisation. Right. There are a million pieces that you could improvise with the same discipline in how to approach that improvisation. So I think, I think that's, it's true that discipline promotes freedom if you uh, insert a layer of, of indirection, because I think, I, I think if you're, 
if you're trying to learn one piece that was written 400 years ago um, and you're playing it over and over again, there is nothing personable, sorry, there's nothing right. personal or creative about that process, even if it's beautiful and satisfying. There has to be some sort of discipline applied to the creativity of self. So I think that uh, I think that is the the layer of indirection which reconciles both approaches to uh, freedom and discipline and enjoyment of music. Discipline applied to the creativity of self. Damn, Zev. Thank you. Now, as an aging man yourself, if you were to give an advice to young folks today of how to approach life and maybe advice to yourself, is there some way you could condense uh, a set of principles, a set of advices you would give to yourself and to other young folks uh, of how to live life? Sure, I would. Uh, I would say that with the collapse of systems that have um, existed for thousands of years, you know, like whatever is happening with universities might be an example of some system that that may or may not be um, decaying. I think with the destruction of of important systems, there is a unique opportunity to invest in oneself. And I think that is always the right approach provided that the investment one makes uh, in his self is obligated towards uh, humanity as a whole. And I think that is, that is uh, the great struggle of my generation. Will we create our own paths that are capable of saving whatever is collapsing or will we be uh, squashed by the debris? And I hope to articulate uh, what patterns I see this struggle taking over the years that my generation becomes particularly active in the world as an important force. Uh, I think already we're important as a, as a demographic to particular markets, but I, I should hope that our voices will matter as well uh, starting very soon. So I would, I would try to think about that. That would be my advice. Do you, uh, it's a silly question to ask perhaps, but, um, and a bit of a Russian one. It's silly because you're young, but I don't think it's actually silly because you're young. Do you ponder your mortality? And are you just afraid of death in general? So, Tying us back to our uh, previous conversations about abstraction versus uh, experience, uh, which is determining our our notions of our life and our our world, death is interesting in that it is obviously hyper important to a person's life, and it is something that, for the most part, no human will really experience and be able to, um, to reflect upon. So our notions of death are sort of proof that if we want to make the most of our lives, we have to think abstractly and uh, relying not at all at times on uh, experiential uh, thought and understandings because we can't really experience death and reflect upon it hence and use it to motivate us. It has to remain some sort of abstraction. And I think if we have trouble comprehending uh, true abstraction, we tend to view our lives as, you know, we tend to view ourselves as nearly immortal. And I think that's very dangerous. So one concrete implication for my belief in abstraction would be that we all need to be aware of our, our our own deaths, and we need to we need to understand concretely the the boundaries of our lifetimes, and no amount of experience can really motivate that. It has to be driven by thought and and abstraction and theory. 
that's one of the deepest elements of what it means to be human is our ability to form abstractions about our mortality versus a animals. I think there's just something really fundamental about our interaction with the abstractions of death. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of philosophers uh, that say that that's actually core to everything we create in this world, which is like us struggling with this impossible to understand idea of mortality. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm drawn to this idea because um, both the, the mystery of it but also just from the human experience perspective, it seems that you get a lot of meaning from stuff ending. It's kind of sad, the flip side of that, to think that stuff won't be as meaningful if it, if it doesn't end, if it's not finite. But it seems like resources gain value from being finite. And uh, that's true for time, that's true for the deliciousness of ice cream, that's true for love, for everything from music mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it seems deeply human to, to try to, uh, as you said, concretize the abstractions of mortality, even though we can never truly experience it because that's the whole point of it. Once it yeah. ends, you can't experience it. Yeah. Again, another ridiculous question. Okay. <laughs> what do you think is the meaning of it all? What's the meaning of life? from your, uh, your deep thinking about this world, is there a good way to answer any of the why questions about this existence here on earth? And as I said, we're here in part by principle and in part by accident. And a lot of the things which bring us joy uh, are programmed to bring us joy to ensure our evolutionary success. And so, I would not necessarily consider uh, all of the things which bring us joy uh, to be meaningful. I think they they play a very uh, a very obvious role in a clear pattern, and we don't have much choice in that. I think that outrules the idea of joy being the meaning of life. I think it's um, I think it's a nice it's a nice thing we get to have, even if it's not inherently meaningful. I think the most uh, the most wonderful thing that we will ever uh, that we have ever been given um, has been our ability to, uh, as I said, observe observe what transcends us as as humans and I think to live a meaningful life is to see that and hopefully contribute to that. So so to try to understand what makes us human and to transcend that and in some small way contribute to it in the finite time we have here. Yeah. Uh, those are some powerful words. So Thank you. You're you're a truly special human being. It's really an honor to talk to you. I can't. I'm just. Uh, I'm a newborn fan of yours, and I can't Thank wait you. to see how you push the world. Please uh, embrace the fear you feel and be bold. And I think you will do some special things in this world. I'm confident. If the world doesn't destroy you, and I hope it doesn't, be strong, be brave. You're an inspiration. Keep doing your thing. And thanks for talking today. Thank you so much, Lev. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Zev Weinstein. And thank you to our sponsors, ExpressVPN, Grammarly Grammar Assistant, Simply Safe Home Security, and Magic Spoon Low Carb Cereal. So the choice is privacy, grammar, safety, or health. Choose wisely, my friends. And if you wish, click the sponsor links below to get a discount and to support this podcast. And now let me leave you with some words from Aristotle. Knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.